Yeah, good morning. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having us. Quite a lot, words you might not be familiar with in this title, quite a lot to unpack, so uh, let's jump right in. So what do we mean when we say attack defense CTF competition? Well, CTF stands for capture the flag, and the kind of capture the flag we're talking about here is capture the flag in the area of information security. So it's an information security contest, basically. So in such a contest, you have an organizing team, and they provide some services, some pieces of software written specifically for that contest, and these do have deliberate vulnerabilities in them. So teams, as participants, they compete, and their job is to find these vulnerabilities and to use them. And the attack defense part of it, we're talking about here, means that each team runs an instance of these services on their own machine, and they're all connected to a central gateway. So every team has the same services, same instance of the same services, and they're all connected. And now their job is to find the vulnerabilities, to use them to attack the other teams, and to fix them in their own instance of the service. And when they attack the other teams, they can steal so-called flags from them. So a flag is just a little secret. And uh, when you steal it from another team, you can then hand it in with the organizers and score points for it. So why are we talking about all of this? Well, as uh, Dylan already mentioned, we're part of the organizing team behind Faust CTF. Um, we started doing that as students and now continue to do so as volunteers. So this has actually very little to do with our day jobs. Um, we've done it seven times since 2015, and Faust CTF is one of the major online attack defense CTF competitions. So the online part means that teams are not on-site with us, that's something other people do, but they're connected through a VPN to our contest network. So what does this network look like? Well, you can see here we have on the one side checkers and on the other side two teams. Of course, there are more teams in practice. And the checkers and the gateway are hosted by us as the organizers. And the role of the checkers is to distribute new flags to the teams so that they can then be stolen by the other teams and to also check for the availability of the services. So, of course, a team could just turn off their machine and not be attacked anymore. And we want to prevent that, so the checkers also check that everything is working all right and that the services are actually working. So this leads us to the main topic of our talk, which is that teams should not be able to, do, to be, uh, not be able to distinguish between different types of traffic. So they should not be able to distinguish between different teams attacking them, and they also shouldn't be able to distinguish between checkers and uh, the teams. Because otherwise, they could just block away all the traffic from uh, the other teams and not be exploitable anymore, but still allow all checker traffic. And to us, at, as the organizers, it would look like everything is all right. So fingerprinting in this case could happen at different layers. It could happen at the HTTP layers, so looking at some header contents or details of the HTTP implementation. And uh, it could also mean looking at details of the TCP implementation of the TCP stack. So there's always implementation, implementation details on those. And there's tools to do this kind of fingerprinting, most prominent one being POF, P0F, by Mikhail Zalewski. So for the rest of this talk, we're going to just look at one client, one server. Um, Checker acts as the client, team acts as the server, and we have the gateway in between. Let's first look at the role of the gateway. So the gateway, first of all, does all the routing. It's basically a router machine for all the traffic in the competition network. And in our case, it also terminates the VPN connections of the teams. And from the beginning on, it already prevented the very trivial kind of fingerprinting, if you want so, which is just looking at the source IP addresses. So of course, we want to hide the real source IP addresses, and we use some NAT rules for that, so that all teams in the traffic coming to them just see the gateway's IP addresses and no real source uh, IP address. So after some additions, we asked ourselves, can we do more than that? Can we even prevent more kinds of fingerprinting? Can we uh, hide more details which would allow you to fingerprint? And then it was our former co-organizer, Malte Kraus, who came up with the idea to use HA proxy for that. And I have to admit, I personally was very skeptical at first. Well, I thought, isn't HA proxy just this kind of reverse proxy load balancer kind of thing, about which we've heard a lot about uh, uh, here at this conference? And uh, yeah, of course it is, and it's quite good at that, but our use case is really different. We want to um, redirect traffic to any destination, 
then do our anonymization, then pass it on to its original destination. And I was skeptical if we could really do that. But uh, yeah, turns out that we can. And Simon is going to tell you more about that now. Right, so we now focus on the implementation. So um, we have the client on the left and uh, the server on the right and the gateway in the middle. And traditionally, as Felix mentioned, it's, it's just a router. So the client sends a request, the gateway forwards it, and it passes on to the server. Now we want to redirect the traffic onto the gateway so that we can use HA proxy to um, perform the anonymization. And we can use a Linux firewall IP tables for that. Um, it provides us with a T-proxy target, which stands for transparent proxy, and um, which exactly redirects the packet to the local machine so that we can process it further. So the command shown um, is, is, uh, is what's necessary. Um, we are using IPv6, so it's IP6 tables. Um, it's a mangle table pre-routing chain. And in this example, we are uh, intercepting TCP uh, port 80, where our service will be running. Then we use tproxy to redirect it to the local host and, um, and on to, to port 5001, where HA proxy uh, will be listening. So in theory, that should uh, be enough and it should work, but it doesn't. We also need um, to use a policy-based routing to add a second routing table um, to redirect the traffic onto the local machine. And uh, the two commands here do exactly that. So the tproxy mark option um, tells the kernel, please mark all packets affected by tproxy and um, label them. And the IP6 rule command um, acts upon this mark with a f uh, a FW mark one and puts all packets matching into uh, the separate routing table. And then the root itself, it's just uh, redirect all packets to the local machine, which is a local keyword as a um, relevant part here. Now, the packets end, uh, end up on the local machine, but that is not enough because um, HA proxy would just ignore them because the destination is still the server on the right side and the IP address of the server is not configured on the local machine. And to fix that, uh, we can use the bind transparent option which um, tells HA proxy accept traffic for all, connect for all destinations and not just uh, the addresses on the gateway. And then HA proxy will do its filtering and then connect back to the original destination and how that works we're going to look in a second. So first the configuration. Um, for the example config here, we are just going to look at uh, the HTTP mode, but TCP um, works basically the same. Um, though, um, we are going to disable all retries because in a CTF challenge it's often the case that teams are offline, they are down, the services are not available, and we don't want to create any additional traffic. So we just disable it, and if a team is down, a proxy will return an error and be done with it. Then we want to disable HTTP keep alive um, with the HTTP close option. And we do that so that we split um, multiple requests into multiple connections uh, in the hope that it makes them more anonymous and um, prevents teams from figuring out if that they are related. And finally, we are using relatively low timeouts so that, team, uh, that requests fail quickly. As I said, in a CTF challenge, um, services are often broken or not uh, up all the time and we want to fail fast. Though, now the front end is where the interesting part happens. As I mentioned, uh, we have bind transparent to accept traffic for all destinations. And then we have option accept uh, invalid HTTP request. Um, that might sound confusing, but uh, challenges in the CTF uh, setup can depend on bugs in the implementation and the services which are provided. And we want to give teams the possibility to exploit these vulnerabilities, and we don't want HA proxy to uh, interfere with that. And finally, uh, the anonymization, which, is with, uh, which just deletes all headers not listed here, the HTTP request del header. So we need uh, some headers for our services to work, and uh, we delete all other headers, for example, like user agent, so the teams um, cannot just check that. So in the back end, now the task is to connect back to the original destination. Um, and for that, um, HA proxy provides us with server asterisk, which um, tells it to look at the IP header, check the destination, and then in the back end connect to that destination. And as I mentioned, we are using IPv6, 
So um, we need a special prefix, which is IPv6 add, um, or it won't work. Um, we leave the source selection unchanged, so it will just choose um, a, 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 a default address. And then, uh, finally, with HTTP response add header, we are adding a custom header to let the teams know um, that we are doing proxying and they are not confused if the behavior changes from a traditional setup. And that's basically the whole configuration. Um, we have the kernel with tproxy and um, the, the policy-based routing, and then the HA proxy front end and uh, back end to connect back to the original destination. And with that, back to Felix. Thanks. So. As Simon mentioned, we're using automatic source address selection for the connections to the back end. And uh, so for the connections to the back end, we have as the source address for the outgoing traffic, we have uh, HA proxies address, which is actually what we want, because as I explained earlier, we don't want teams to see the real source address. But there's a catch with that, which is that as CTF organizers, we want to be able to look into the traffic and see what's going on. So. We, in our traffic captures, still want to see the real source address. And when we capture the traffic right after HA proxy, we don't see it anymore. And we don't really see the original source of the traffic. And we can't debug very well. So there would be an option to still achieve that, which would be the use as a C client option of HA proxy. And this tells HA proxy to basically spoof the source address. So uh, it was going to use the source address of the original source for its connections, to its outgoing connections to the back end. Um, and then what we could do is we could capture the traffic right after that, analyze it, and then again apply our NUT afterwards. So uh, we're still going to hide the original source address from the teams, of course, but we're going to do, continue doing that with the NUT rule. And uh, bef just before that, capture our traffic and be able to look into it with the original source addresses. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work in practice because in Linux, the traffic just won't show up in the NUT table uh, of the post-routing chain. We don't really know why that is the case, so uh, if anybody knows more, come talk to us afterwards. So what were our experiences with the setup? Well, we've used it in five CTF editions so far, and it has work worked pretty flawlessly. Um, Simon mostly explained the HTTP part. The TCP part is much simpler. So uh, non-HTTP services just get the whole, we do a new connection to hide details of the TCP stack, but we won't do any header modifications or something else there. Um, our traffic numbers are not that impressive, to be honest. We've heard a lot of good talks here about handling high volumes of traffic with HA proxy. This is not one of them. We have a few megabytes per second of traffic, but yeah, nothing too interesting in, in terms of volume here. Um, we started using it with IPv4, and we switched to IPv6 uh, in 2020, and that also worked without any issues. We're using the HAProxy open source community edition, just the packages from the Debian repositories. Nothing too fancy here, no enterprise customers. And yeah, we're striving for completely transparent proxying, but what you can see here is that this doesn't always work in practice. So you do have cases like timeouts at the back end or uh, closed ports at the back end, and we can't really resemble the original behavior with HA proxy in those cases. So what we do is we just uh, show this error message you can see here. So finally, let's talk about what we could do in the future. As I just mentioned, we don't have impressive traffic numbers. In fact, we don't have any traffic numbers at all right now. We're really lacking some observability, so we probably should have attended the workshop on that on Monday. But we didn't. But maybe we're still uh, going to get some observability in the future. Um, another idea would be using TLS uh, for the CTF services. We don't do that at the moment. And also in that case, we as organizers still want to be able to look into the traffic and introspect it. So HA proxy could also help with that. And that would also be the foundation for some more advanced protocols like HTTP2 or HTTP3 with QUIC, about which we've heard a lot of interesting stuff yesterday. Um, yeah, maybe we're going to have more of that in the future. And finally, there's the idea to use NF tables instead of IP tables. So that might maybe allow us to be, allow us to be more flexible and solve the problem uh, I discussed previously with the traffic not showing up in the right IP tables table. Um, maybe NF tables can help there and be more flexible. So with that, uh, we thank you for your attention. Thanks for having us. If you want to participate in Faust CTF, uh, 
go maybe find a theme to participate in, and I guess the next edition is going to be in summer of next year. Now we have some time for questions. Wonderful job, gentlemen. Uh, as a reminder, raise your hand nice and tall if you have a question, and we'll bring a, we'll bring a microphone around to you. And we already have a first question here, so go ahead. Uh, thank you for the, this presentation. It's a really fun usage. Um, I think that for the 503 you are facing, you could just use uh, the error files uh, to send something empty and uh, be done with it. Or maybe just play with the after response or something like this so that you can force a reset instead of sending a 503. Okay. Um, and uh, for the issue you're facing with NAT, I suspect that in fact it's because the connection leaves HAProxy with exactly the same parameters as the first one. So it matches an existing entry in the table. So you think it's actually showing up in some, it should be showing up in some incoming chain? In fact, you keep everything the same. You have the same source IP source port for the destination IP and port. And when the new connection leaves, it has exactly the same five tuple. So it matches an existing connection. Maybe you should use ah, okay. the namespaces uh, to split them. You could have a contract table in one namespace and another one in another one. And you can use the namespace argument on the, either the bind line or the server line. Yeah, Maybe that sounds, it could work. That sounds promising. Yeah, thank you. Okay. As a reminder, if you're online, you can submit a question in the stream, and I'll read them out here. Uh, we do have a couple that came in. One I think you already answered, but maybe just to say again and more information, who can join a CTF competition? And maybe point, point them where they could find more info. Yeah, so basically anybody can do it. Um, in practice, I wouldn't recommend doing it alone, so uh, it's good to find a team. So most teams are located with universities, but there's also some independent team, there's teams. There's also some remote teams these days. And uh, my recommendation would be not starting with an attack defense CTF because this can be really hard to manage all the infrastructure and it can be overwhelming at first. So the actually more common kind of CTF is uh, so-called Jeopardy CTF, where you just have like challenges but don't host the network. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of these. There's a platform which lists them, which is ctftime.org, if you're interested. Great. Uh, and so this, this would be a question, I think, for both of you more on a personal note. What do you like most about working on CTF competitions? So maybe for the audience, you could explain a little bit how you got into it, in the first, what drew you to this. And obviously, it's a lot of work to put in to, to pull them off um, that you've illustrated here. So you know, what do you like the most? And maybe we could hear that from both of you. Okay. So, uh, well, as I said, we started doing this while at university. So it's a fun way to learn about information security in practice. And uh, yeah, then for, for me or for both of us really, um, I ended up not doing too, man, too many actual CTF challenges, but always was more in the infrastructure part of the team and yeah, doing uh, infrastructure for South CTF, but also for Faust, when we, which is the CTF team, uh, when we participate in, in other people's competition. Yeah, same, same for me. I, I just like networking. I like uh, computer networks and having fun with like setting crazy uh, HA proxy setups. And yeah, it was fun. So that's why I keep doing it. Very cool. Excellent. Well, that's all the time we have. Oh, sorry. There, we can get one more over here. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm on the other side of um, your presentation, I guess, because um, as a participant in uh, Capture the Flags, we try to fingerprint traffic from other teams and from the organizers. and we have some Wireshark stuff going on. And the question is, um, do you have this set up virtualized or use um, bare metal machines for, for your stuff? OK, so this at the moment is running on virtual machines. Yeah, we have it running on, on, on virtual machines. It's, uh, I had it on notes of previous slides. It's four gateway machines with 16 cores each, I guess. And they're like kind of saturized, but it's not only a proxy. It's also the VPN and the routing going on on them. And yeah, regarding your CTF experience, maybe you should talk afterwards uh, if you were successful yeah. in, in the fingerprinting. Yeah, I would like that. Thank you. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you.